we're grateful for everyone who actually makes that effort. They don't have to. They can just be listening and, you know, not acknowledge that. But the fact that they want to come and say hello and share that with us is really powerful. I think one of the things that is quite close to me and Ashish is we got approached by someone remotely wanted to really talk to us and I was kind of curious as to why this person was so eager to talk to us and this was someone who and for context like is a farmer back in India which isn't probably like a farmer in Australia it's you know they probably don't come from the same kind of means and he would listen to the podcast while he was farming somewhere in a rural area in India and he just wanted to talk to us and tell us that he actually got a job in cyber security about after listening to the conversations it's one story but that was just something that we were like you, you can't even imagine touching someone that remote in my head i'm thinking like someone this you know listening to this podcast out in the field in india but has been able to change the direction of their life and we probably had a really tiny part to play there so that was really humbling as well. So those are the kind of things and I think you guys will obviously have many of those stories but it's worthwhile holding on to that because like I think amongst all of that it's about the lives you can touch in a little way. Um everyone kind of makes their own path but you know if you can influence that in a part, in small way it's really rewarding I think. For me that's kind of like the meaning of life. Um you know if you can walk away and I'm getting very philosophical here so <laughs> it's it's uh, but yeah I think if you can uh, you know leave the world a better place it's always good. Great. Shilpi, thanks so much for joining us on Dark Mode. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, maybe to start off with, Shilpi, if you could give us an overview on your background and what you're doing and, and of course, a bit of an insight into Cloud Security Podcast, that'd be great. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, um, my name is Shilpi. Um, I'm the producer and also the co-host for Cloud Security Podcast. Um, it's just a podcast about all things cloud security. So, I'd like, no, uh, it's a pretty straightforward name. I think we just went for simplicity with it. Um, I think it seems to have stuck around. Um, before, I think, doing Cloud Security Podcast, which we've been running for three and a half years, I've always had a career in risk management, So, but more the legal and the finance side of things. Um, Ashish, uh, my co-host and the main host for Cloud Security Podcast, he was in cybersecurity. And I think had, looks, looking at him having conversations and things, I just got Got interested in it um and then you know it, it just grew from three and a half years ago to now where we are so that's the short version of um how we got here yeah love it and very excitingly just recently you have officially partnered with sneak as well do you want to tell us a bit about that Yes. Um, and it came, I mean, we weren't really looking for per se partnership. Obviously, we've had, uh, we've been very fortunate. We've actually worked with a lot of um, different companies over the last three years. Obviously, you know, um, as you know, when you run a podcast, um, as much as it is a labor of love, you know, there are bills that are associated with it. And we've been very fortunate. We've had some really great companies who we've worked with. Um, who sponsored us, we've partnered, we've done different projects with them. And um, Sneak was something that came around earlier this year. Um, it just felt right. We were obviously, I think not many people probably knew, but both Ashish and I had full-time jobs. Um, you know, we were both in leadership. Ashish was a CISO prior to this. And um, it was just juggling everything. And I think, you know, we were always thinking there would be um, it would be amazing to be able to do you know, this full time because we always had ideas and, you know, there wasn't enough time in the day. And um, it was just getting so much love from the community. I guess we wanted for it to grow and to be able to give more things back. So, yeah, um, Sneak came around earlier this year. We had some really good conversations with them. Um, I think the thing that stuck with us is they they wanted us to still remain vendor neutral, which was a very big thing for us, um, remain community first, which was, again, very big thing for us. Um, so they just aligned with us a lot. So the founder at Sneak also has his own podcast. Um, so he runs the Secure Developer and that's been running for six years. And he also has the same ethos where he just likes talking about, you know, the problem statements. So I think we we knew that they were already doing something that was similar. So it wasn't just, you know, um, hearing what they were saying, but sometimes, you know, you look at what they're doing. Um, and one question that they asked us when the whole thing signed up was, what is that would make your community happy. And they always kept asking about that. So yeah, it just felt like a good fit. Um, I think we were a few months into it and so far it's been pretty good. Yeah, amazing. And having seen the content that you did prior to the partnership with now so much time back, she'll be in for a sheet as, as well. I'm really excited to see what content you produce and how creative you get. And who knows, even a collaboration with Dark Road, I'm sure that'll uh, keep the fans happy out there. 
Definitely. Yeah. And I think no pressure, though. I think that's one thing we, Ashish and I keep talking. We're like, now we really have to, like, we've got no excuses, right? So we really have to. Like, earlier on, we were like, oh, we couldn't do this. You know, obviously, we've got like our jobs, but now it's like, no. But no, we're, we're definitely very excited. And we've got lots of really cool things in the pipeline that we're working on. Um, just being able to do this. Um, I think there's so much, I think cloud security, anyway, we believe is something that's growing and is going to keep growing. And, uh, there's just so much more that we could do in the space. Um, I always talk about the fact, like the first year we ran the podcast, my thinking was, oh, you, we've had 50 episodes in the first year for cloud security. That that should be plenty. Like that, we would have covered all the cloud security topics by then. But um, clearly, just one of those fields where there's something or the other just keeps ha- coming up, um, which is great. You know, obviously keeps us going as well. It's it's one of the most critical realms of our industry. It's always going to be an issue. Uh, and, and I think you guys, uh, with the cloud security podcast are doing a fantastic job in creating that community and creating the awareness around cloud security. It's, it's going to be interesting as we move into, you know, web 3.0 and, and, uh, and the metaverse and things like that, where, where we're all cloud natives. What, what's your thoughts on, uh, on moving into web 3.0 metaverse and all things being cloud native? Yes, um, I think there's a lot of interesting conversations that because I think part of the um, podcast, we do obviously go to a lot of the conferences and speak to a lot of thought leaders. And it's really interesting uh, the con- kind of conversations that are coming up with Web3 and Metaverse and the enhancement of technology. And I think um, someone, qu- I can't remember who said this, but one of the conversations that we had was um it's also our adversaries who are getting access to all this enhanced technology. So, you know, we always talk about the fact that, yes, our infrastructure is going to be, you know, on Web3 or we're going to be in Metaverse, but it's all the things that the adversaries will also have access to. You know, they're, I think, um, and I'm, I'm afraid to like quote someone because like my conversations have gotten merged, but someone did say like, uh, the hackers out there are also becoming unicorns. We've got like companies that are becoming unicorns, but it's also hackers. They're being funded by, you know, blockchain projects. Um, so that realm is really changing. So it's interesting while technology is great, but we have to be mindful that obviously it's everyone who has access to that as well. Um, and it'll definitely change the same way. I guess cloud kind of changed the realm. You know, at first it was the internet. Then it was cloud, I feel. And now maybe the next thing would be metaverse and Web3. So it's kind of like similar things where things get better. There's more that we can do, but there's more that we probably have to look after as well. Yeah, it's one of those universal laws of cybersecurity too. She'll be, isn't it? Which is just like hackers gone hack. Like as much yeah. as technology <laughs> advances and like, you know, we can use technology for good. There's always an adversarial black hat nature of it. And we've got to be really cognizant of that as well. So interesting times ahead, that's for sure. Definitely. And they are definitely getting much more sophisticated. So something uh, we were at DEF CON and Black Hat um, just a few weeks ago and a lot of talks that we attended and a few people we spoke to, it does sound like um, they're getting much more um, sophisticated. So some of the different methodologies that they have used to, you know, conduct some of the hacks, cloud-based hacks um, have been quite sophisticated. So that is something that is happening in the industry. And um I, again, I'm like, we're not about, as you said, uh, you know, before in our chat um, that we don't want to want it to be like fear mongering. But there was this notion in the keynote um, that they said that things actually may get worse before they get better, because there's a lot of things right now in the cybersecurity community that are a real concern, you know, supply chain. I know that's a bit of a buzzword these days, but um, that is something that, you know, there are a lot of different gaps. People are finding that, um, you know, a lot of the cloud security providers have defaults that are quite dangerous. So there's lots of these things. And um, I don't know whether it's, you know, something I agree with or not, but, you know, there's that sense that, you know, there's lots of things that could make it worse before it gets better. We're always consistently hanging on that balance. It's just like walking that fine line. And I don't think we'll ever be on one side of that line. I think we'll consistently be on that fine line, whether it can teeter each way, but generally we'll, we'll get our navigation path pretty well corrected and uh, and we'll steer the course, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Can I just say as well, and for the public record, that like it's it's cool to say buzzwords. I don't know, I've noticed <laughs> that people are like, oh, there's a buzzword, but it's like, let's just go for it. Like it's universal yeah. understanding with common language, I think so. But to that point, the supply chain threats is really something that's prominent in the cloud security space. She'll be, and you'd be speaking about this really oftentimes, I'm sure. Can yeah. we go there now? What are some of those really emergent trends happening in cloud security in particular? What are the, some of the biggest vulnerabilities coming out of the cloud space? And what are you seeing as general themes around that area? Yeah. Um, supply chain security, as you said, is, um, and you're quite right, you know, like I think we went into 
Um, I remember the first time we started having this conversation earlier in this year around supply chain was at RSA. And we actually went into the thing going, is it a buzzword or is it actually something like, you know, is there meat behind this? And I think what we found, and um, there's a couple of videos that we've done on actually like the digital supply chain, why it's currently broken and what we can do to fix it. Um, I think the digital supply chain at the moment does have a lot of vulnerabilities. So one of the things is obviously open source dependencies. So I think that is something um, that is quite rampant. The community uses a lot of open source code, which is great. There's a lot of really good code out there. But um, often with these projects, um, I think recently they spoke about one of the breaches where there was only a couple of people who were just maintaining it part time on the side. And it was one of the most prolifically used open source codes out there. So that's a big issue obviously with supply chain a lot of people are using open source code um i think the open ssf has recently obviously started a project to try and identify which are which are one of these are the top codes out there um that the community is using and then what can we be doing as a community to protect that so i thought that's a really good initiative um because open source is important for innovation i think we are very supportive of that because it allows you know everyone to innovate um move really fast but that has really opened us as a cybersecurity community to a lot of vulnerabilities. So projects like that, community projects, where I think the uh, overall arching theme that I'm seeing is a lot of the problems that we have, it really will require a lot of people to come together to solve it. Supply chain is not something that one company can solve by one product. It's it's a cybersecurity community problem that we need to come together to solve. Um, I think the other couple of things, API security is one that's really coming up. Um, because, you know, with the adoption of like a lot of digital transformation, um, a lot of API adoption has happened. So that's something that we are starting to see as a trend with supply chain. Um, and the other one is just third parties. So when you're onboarding third parties, um, are you doing your due diligence? What, I guess, vulnerabilities and gaps are they bringing along? So um, that's another thing that's been a bit of a focus for the supply chain. Should be huge year for you guys rsa defcon black cat all in the same year kudos that's that's a huge <laughs> that's 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 some people's bucket list so yeah. well done i missed you guys at rsa i was there as well and uh i i i found the theme of rsa was very much api security it was very much topical uh and one of the the key phrases that uh, that i picked up as a result of that is that we live in an api economy uh and the api economy is consistently growing and with that uh, people need to understand the the vulnerabilities associated with uh, with APIs. So I um, just wanted to to give a nod to that conversation before I jump back to the open source piece. I agree. I think open source is important for what we're all trying to achieve here, and and it's it's about getting the developers out there who want to make their own projects and put it open source to get the community involved. I think that's important, um, but we've got to look at the the vulnerabilities associated with that too. Look at GitHub. You know their repos got uh, injected with a whole bunch of malware a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, uh, and uh, and for a long time that wasn't picked up. They're all open source projects that people have now deployed, uh, and as a result, have injected uh, malware by proxy. So there's a whole bunch in there for open source, but I agree it's it's very much uh, required as the industry grows. Yeah, definitely. And with that too, the uh, the open source piece we talked a lot about it with uh, one of our previous guests, Sean Duker, about. Uh, it's it's not about putting guardrails alongside some of those developers that, that do the open source process. It's about letting them be creative. Yeah. Um, but we've all got to come together as a community to understand what the repercussions are if we do things uh, nefariously. So I'm really interested to see where the open source platform takes as we enter, you know, metaverse and things like that. And I think the conversation is at the right point of the right time now where we're all looking to to make sure it's secure. Um, but when you tack on API security or the API connectors to open source platforms, there's a real potential for some damage and going back to that fine line we're walking on. Definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of compounding things as well. Obviously we're talking about all these things in its isolation, but in cybersecurity, you know, you're dealing with a company would be dealing with multi multiple of these issues at the same time. So that can be quite challenging. And yeah, digital supply chain definitely is very complex um, area for most companies and a lot of organizations that we've seen, you know, quite a lot of um, obviously breaches and different vulnerabilities that have come out throughout this year. So that's on top of mind for people and rightly so. I think that's kind of like 
the differentiation that we made to add to your point, you know, buzzwords sometimes are there for a good reason, um, because that's what the community is thinking about. Um, there's actually a buzzword bingo that someone puts out at DEF CON Black Hat, which was they kind of put up all the buzzwords that they're hearing and what what's popping up and how that has changed. So um, there is also a lot of CDR, XDR apparently coming up as well. So that was something that we were hearing. But yeah, um, supply chain security. See, I definitely after all like the conversations we've had and after all the research that we do, did it, I do believe that's something that we do need to pay attention towards. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I actually do think it's one of the biggest trends and areas that we should be focusing on, especially as it pertains to the cloud environment, because things are just evolving at such a rapid rate. Uh, uh, excuse me. Things are evolving at such a rapid rate. And just the complexity, as you alluded to, should be around how many different third party suppliers there are, you know, how many API connectors there are. There's like a plethora of applications being developed and used and consumed all in the cloud. Like there's so much to this area that you could go down seven to 17 layers on and and d dive into a host of how to solve pretty complex problems around this. So, and you see also the industry's response to it, like the rise of many up and coming cloud born vendors, you know, arising in a, in a very saturated market and, and domain of security as well, domain of technology trying to solve problems and it's just because new threats arise all the time in, in new environments as well. That's very true. No, it, it, I think it is, the market is definitely maturing. I think we've got some really creative vendors out there and I think they obviously keep questioning the norm, which is great. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening and I think, um, you know, another thing I keep going back to Black Hat Def because that's, I think that's top of mind for me, but, um, an interesting thing that was being mentioned over there is like, are we keeping pace with where we need to be? And that's, an interesting one because I think the last couple of years, because of obviously the pandemic, a lot of things happened at a very quick pace. A lot of people went digital very quickly. They onboarded a lot of third parties really quickly. A lot of things happened. And now it almost feels we're trying to like rectify some of the stuff that has happened and make sure, okay, did we onboard, you know, some gaps into our system or have we like just, you know, used some open source, which we shouldn't have. So we may be playing a bit of catch up. Um, so there was that question that are, have we kept pace or are we keeping pace with where we need to be? Um, and it's that fine line that you were talking about as well. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a race to adoption, really. It's uh, trying to keep up with the nefarious side, trying to keep up with uh, the, the evolution of what is now such a cloud dominant industry uh, and, and all things associated with that. It, it's a constant race. I think that fine line is is constantly being teetered. So I'm going to go back to that. It's the first time I've used that analogy, and I'm going to, I'm going to use that more often. I think. I think it's a good <laughs> one because it's it's, it's very uh, on the money there because you are. That's exactly how it feels, and also like add to that that every company out there, obviously, security as much as it should be top of mind, it's not their primary goal of the business unless you are a cybersecurity company. You know, you're trying to release great products. You know, you're trying to run a business, um, and security is just something that needs to be considered, but it's not the prime focus. So there is that fine line about. Yes, we want to do all the right things, but can we really take a year to release what we need to? That's not pragmatic. So you, you know, have to find that balance between, yes, we want to release a product as secure as possible. But sometimes in the real world, you know, you do have to make compromises because you've you've got competition, you've got, you know, your uh, customers who are asking for things. So uh, it's a fine line. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Shilpi, what are the, have you got any examples or stories from the CISO? persona themselves in some of your recent episodes? I think um, a lot of CISOs that we do speak to, I think the biggest challenge for them at the moment is that, that again, you know, like I'm going back to that fine line or that balance. A lot of them are grappling with different things. Obviously, there is, um, you know, a skill shortage in the industry. So a lot of people don't have enough people to do different things. Um, they need to make sure that, you know, their organizations are secure. So the biggest thing that has come out of at least the last few years has been the fact that they've had to go through rapid change in a lot of organizations. So um, I think we um, spoke to people at Zoom. Um, so they've obviously had you know, a massive change in um, you know what's happened over the last few years, where everyone's kind of, you know, hopped onto Zoom much more than it. it Zoom's become a thing. Like we are currently on Zoom, so um, you know that's probably like they spoke about. You know how they have dealt with the rapid change and the things that they've had to do. Um, it's been a lot of you know running different programs in the organizations to make sure that you know people are aware. Um, but again, if you don't have enough people in the team, how do you battle with that? So there's just the juggling priorities when it's coming to different forms of digital transformation. Um, supply chain has been top of mind for people. So obviously, uh, Log4j did not help 
anyone. So that was a lot of stress coming off at the end of last year. So people really entered 2022 with this really heightened state going, okay, you know, we've dealt with that over Christmas, New Year's. Um, we'd really need to sort of make sure that, you know, we don't have too many gaps uh, within our organization as well. So I think a lot of CISOs this year definitely are very focused on the security of their companies. You know, obviously that's their primary goal, but it's just, it just one of those I guess it's been those few years where, you know, things have moved rapidly. There's been a lot of digital transformation, but also there have been these big vulnerabilities that have come out going, okay, you know, we've onboarded a lot of things and we know that there are things that are being exploited. So that's been kind of like the conversation that a lot of, a lot of CISOs have had. Um, also, there's, as you said, you know, we spoke about different security vendors uh, out there. Um, there's lots of them. And I think a lot of CISOs are kind of trying to figure out what's the best one, you know, they they seem to be different ones that are solving kind of similar problems from a different angle. Um, there are a lot of vendors out there. So that's another thing that they're really wanting to understand, you know, how the problems are being solved for their organization. So just some simplicity over there. And again, like cybersecurity or cloud security isn't an easy problem to solve. So um, while it'll be amazing to, you know, sort of have that one bullet going, this will solve all your cloud security problems. Um, there's different layers and complexities to that. So that's another thing that, um, you know, we often speak to CISOs about, about how they're solving different problems in their organizations. There's uh there's 4,300 vendors currently in the security market at last count, which, uh, oh. which I found absolutely fascinating. God. So imagine being a CISO trying to work out which vendor fits their in their digital ecosystem. Uh, and I think Jamie Bain talked about that growing uh, by 200 vendors uh, every quarter or every half. Hey, Shilpi, have you seen that Cyberscape infographic of all the vendors? No, I haven't. Like, that was interesting when you mentioned 40. Like, I knew there were a lot. Um, I'm going to show you. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen right now and show you the Cyberscape infographic. This is, like, next level. For anyone that's listening to the audio and tuning in to oh the video, <laughs> take a look at the video right now. This is Momentum Cyber. I've done a very infamous cyberscape graphic around all of the vendors solving complex problems in cybersecurity. You can see everything from IoT to threat intel to endpoint to network. It's all there. What do you think of this, Shilpi? That is crazy. Like, the, thank you for showing me because when you said 4300, I'm like, can't be. That just doesn't sound right. Um, I'm, I can see like cloud security. Obviously, my eyes directly went to cloud security. Like, how many vendors are there? Um, I don't know how many. That looks like maybe about a hundred ish or so. But yeah, um, it's, it is a growing space. There's so many vendors out there, and I I really sort of feel for you know CISOs who are having to make a decision because they're not just making decisions on cloud security. They'll be making decisions on all these different vendors, and like how do you pick? And a lot of them do similar things, uh, but you just want to find that right one for your organization. So, well, oh, this is really interesting. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll link it to the show notes as well. And send over a copy she'll be I'll have to talk about that in the next cloud security podcast yeah that's yeah. very interesting no that's that's very very interesting to see that there's that many vendors and I mean it's definitely palpable when you go to any of the conferences I'm sure you would have uh, seen that at RSA so there are a lot a lot of them are doing really interesting things I definitely like going to see like the innovation box and the arsenal and all of those places because you see the new upcoming ones and sometimes they have some really like you know interesting ways of you know the next thing that we should be looking out for but yeah, that's a tough job out there for us. You sort of pick what's the right fit for the organization. And then you maybe pick one and, you know, your problem statement changes or there's something else um, that seems like a better fit that comes along. So it's always that, again, that fine line, as you said. <laughs> yeah. Another book. Going back there, I'm going to hold it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fine line analogy, Ben, we'll have you quoted. We'll play that one on the loop. That'll be yes. a creative asset. You can turn it into like a rap or something. That's a new thing, right? Like people say that and turns into some like TikTok rap. I just that's keep good. thinking about my money don't jiggle jiggle on me. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I was playing in my head. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Shilby, I want to take you to Black Hat. Tell me about Black Hat. What was the experience? I know that a lot of our listeners either want to go there, are planning to go there, or may have gone there once. What was 2022 like? It was really good. I think... Um, it's hard to actually think about just Black Hat on its own. I think because it's just Hacker Summer Camp, there's so many things that happen. And I think that's what really makes it the full experience. So there's obviously Def Con there as well. Um, there's B-Side Vegas that happens just a little bit before. And there's um, a thing called Diana Initiative, which is more about um, generating inclusivity in the community as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that happen. Definitely, I think it's a great place for anyone who's interested in cybersecurity to go. This was my first time going there. And initially I was like, okay, you know, like, 
<laughs> what's the big hype about but i get it um defcon obviously is very cool like they've got a village for everything that you can think of so like biohack village they had a voting machine village um so you can hack anything that you anything that is connected to anything in any way so it was really good um i think black hat in a way, it's a little bit like RSA, where there are obviously a lot of vendors, but I think the talks definitely have a bit more technical theme. So that was interesting. Um, but a lot of interesting things were happening. So they've got this thing called Arsenal in there, where they sort of talk about newer tooling and newer, newer products that are coming through. So that was really interesting as well. Um, but no, it's, it's a great conference to go. Um, if you, But it is catered a little bit more towards the technical side of things, whereas I think RSA is a bit more about thought leadership and business. So that's probably the differentiation, but they're both great. You get, to, I think the best part about conferences, and I know you would have seen that at RSA is just meeting fellow InfoSec, InfoSec people, you know, people that you probably either see um, all the time, you know, you communicate with on different platforms or you admire and you get to actually talk to them. So I think that's definitely the best part about meeting people, but there's some really good talks that happen as well. I, I found that so amazing at rsa just the the access you get to people like you said that you just you wouldn't think of running into uh for instance at rsa i was crossing the road heading into the moscow west center uh and ran into uh john hammond a oh, yeah. huge uh youtuber massive yep. following uh ran into him on the street and in the middle of the zebra crossing him and i had about a 10 minute conversation and took some yep. photos and then continued on yeah. Uh, and then heading into the Moscow North the next morning, I ran into Leo Div, uh, the founder of Cyber Reason and his whole crew, uh, sat there and chatted with it. It's just, it, it's one of those places where you get more out of the people that are around you from the community. I yeah. think then, then, you know, as a practitioner in cybersecurity, you get out of some of the boots. Yeah, definitely. No, I I agree. Like that's the best part about attending any conferences is the people that you just happen to bump into. Um, you know, it's just hard sometimes trying to find calendar invites and people's time, but it's just a, it's like one of those weeks that you just soak it all in. You have some great conversations and you really come out of it. Like you feel like, you know, you kind of have a pulse on where the industry is at, what people are thinking, but also just like get to meet some really awesome people. I think I've been, um, you know, fully into, I guess, cybersecurity probably for three, four years now. And I feel the people, the industry is really great. I think most of the people that we've spoken to deal with are really helpful. They genuinely want to share knowledge. And I think that's kind of what makes me feel like, um, you know, we, we do, have a lot of great things ahead for us because as a community people want to share um people want to you know like pro solve problems together even though they may be like you know even competing vendors they still are happy to talk to each other about how they're solving it um you know so that's that's a really positive thing yeah it's almost like the community comes together for the greater good as well she'll be in this industry i do think it's really important that infosec practitioners do that because mm. you're actually doing something bigger than yourself aren't you so. yes definitely and we, we i definitely have and I think I probably have that outsider's view still because I haven't been in the industry for 15, 20 years like a lot of, you know, uh, other people. But um, I've definitely felt that coming into it, that everyone's been so welcoming. People are happy to share their knowledge. Um, and yeah, it is about just solving problems together. And even when, you know, people deliver talks and stuff, they're really trying to share how they've done something, but how someone else can maybe improve on it as well. So that's that's how things are getting better. And that's probably the reason why the industry is so mature so far. I think there'll always be a level of ego in every industry, but as, as a general statement, cybersecurity, because we're so broad as in, you know, an accountant can come and transition to cybersecurity quite quickly because they've got an analytical brain and, you know, a lawyer can transition to cybersecurity quite quickly because of the ramifications. It's such a broad industry that we've created. It has to be welcoming and therefore ego is very far down the, the, the Richter scale. Uh, so far so that the people with that, they generally stand out and the, you just sort of know. But as more of a collective, I think we really are a true community. Uh, and you see that at those some of those big events. You really see the access you get to people and, and the willingness to stop and have a conversation, I, I think, is unique to this industry. I've been in a few industries in, in my, you can see by the grays in my beard mm -hmm. uh, in my time. Uh, and, and this truly is the industry where it, it is inclusive to the point of a, a true community being built. Yeah, definitely. And I think there is a lot of merit to that. I think there's been a lot of conversation around that diversity in cybersecurity. I know a lot of people are talking about that. And that fact that people coming in from different fields, as you said, like say from accounting or something else, everyone will bring that different um, lens to cybersecurity. And they always talk about the fact that adversaries themselves also have different lenses. So it's we all can't be thinking the same way. So it's good that the community does you know, want to include people in it as well. Obviously, this sounds like there's a lot more work to be done in that space, speaking to a lot of people. But 
at least everyone's thinking about it, about it and having those conversations. It's a really great concept because it actually comes down to the way people think and like having differences in opinions and perspectives. And like another example, when Bastian Treptel joined us on an episode, Ben, he was like a convicted hacker when he was really young, stole credit cards and like he only got caught from the cops because he was just buying heaps of pizzas for parties. It's just like a hilarious story, but he went on to be one of the co-founders of a really big cybersecurity firm and he used to hire actors for more social engineering and pen testing type consulting yeah. work. It's just like really cool. It's, it's really encouraging as well as... You know, we do need more people and want more people from diverse backgrounds to join the industry. It just makes for a far better collective intelligence output, I think. So that's cool. true. Yeah. You mentioned we've got a lot of work to do there, Should be I'm keen to dive into that because we've got both got great platforms. Uh, I've got two daughters. I would love to see them, you know, be welcomed into technology careers when they grow. So I'm all about uh, uh, making sure that, that that is a possibility. I know at RSA there was uh, women in security booths and there was a whole bunch of uh, of neurodiverse boosts there, of getting more people uh, as a true inclusive community involved. So talk to me about some of the issues you're, you're seeing and and, uh, and how we can overcome them. Yeah. So I think this was a conversation, again, as you said, at RSA as well as, and also something that we talk to most of our guests um, in regards to, you know, where their opinions are and what can we do. Um, I think everyone acknowledges, I don't think there was a single person that we spoke to. And we've actually done a few interviews and we're going to do, release like a, um, an episode just on, you know, what people are saying about this. So that was something that we were capturing as well. And I don't think a single person said that we are there yet. Everyone said things um, need a lot of improvement. Yes, there have been roadways in terms of, you know, we are seeing more diversity within cybersecurity, but everyone acknowledged that, look, we're not where we need to be. There's a lot of work to be done. It was interesting to uh, speak to a few people who have been in the industry for like 30 plus years. And they said, oh, of course, things have gotten much better since because I remember I was we were speaking to a woman um, and she said that she was used to be the only person in her entire company in cybersecurity. Um, and that's definitely shifting a little bit, but not as much, obviously. I think the rate of women in cybersecurity or is it cloud security is still about, I think, 20 percent. So it's not equal. Um, again, you know, that's just one gender. There's, you know, other genders that we need to cater to different demographic neurodiversity. So, um, it's, it's a big question. And we did ask, you know, how do we, we all, okay, we all acknowledge, you know, this exists, but how do we address it? Um, and there were different things that people proposed and I don't really, again, it's one of those things, there is no silver bullet. It'll be a bit of everything, but, um, hiring managers being more open to getting people who are from different backgrounds. Um, and again, that's something that's easier said than done because the leaders are often grappling with, they would love to support someone who's from a different industry, but that does require resource and time. And sometimes, you know, if you're running an organization that needs, you know, things done instantly, that can be a difficult choice for a leader, but more of that being seen from leaders would be obviously one thing that would be great to see. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, that we spoke to who are new to the industry, they said, it's always great to see walk into an interview room and actually see people who look like you or, you know, who you can relate to as well. So obviously, you know, if you walk into an interview room and nobody looks anything like you, that can be intimidating for people as well. So just in harboring that. Um, and then obviously conversations, I think those are important. So I think that's one thing that we are seeing at a, a lot of places, different conferences, that those conversations around diversity are happening. So even at um, Black Hat DEF CON, there were lots of talks. Obviously, Dina Initiative is a conference that completely is dedicated to that in that week. But even within Black Hat DEF CON, there were lots of conversations around how can we um, get more diversity? What can people do? People sharing their different experiences. But again, it's not going to be one of those things that we're going to just turn a switch. And next year, you know, we've got a fully balanced, diverse community. But the fact that we are talking about it and people are thinking about it, I think is, is a good step. And then it's about organizations, leaders, and people mentoring other people. You know, even I think podcasts, like things that what you guys are doing, um, you know, what we are hoping to do, just getting information out there that's accessible to everyone. So that's, I think, one of the main reasons why we started Cloud Security Podcast was to share knowledge with everyone, cloud security knowledge with everyone. So um, Ashish and I used to run DevSecOps Melbourne Meetup before the pandemic. And that had to stop, obviously. And then cloud security was on a rise and a lot of people were asking uh, specifically, Ashish, you know, how do I get into cloud security? What can I do? And it's like, how do we scale that? That's what we were thinking. And that's how we started cloud security podcast. So anyone who's sharing knowledge out there can go a long way in creating that as well. It's amazing that there's 14 spheres of influence, as I understand it, uh, as a guest told us once. 
uh, and and we're one part of that as podcasts. But if we can influence one, two, three, four, or many people, then uh, then it's, it's a job well done for us as uh, as podcast hosts. Um, so I'm very supportive of that. Um, w- with the the event that was in in Vegas, you mentioned just before that was specifically dedicated to that. I, I wasn't aware of that. That's that's really interesting. Are you able to give us more insight onto to what that is? And it's during the uh, the, the the same week as as the Black Hats and Defcons, right? Yes, yeah, so it's called the Diner Initiative, and um, we were obviously like divvying up our time between all the conferences, so I couldn't give it as much time as I would have liked to, but they're dedicated. Um, the whole conference is about inclusivity within cybersecurity, and I think they have a lot of talks around that, but also they try to have talks from people you know who are from different diversity backgrounds as well. So um, I think I can share the link with you after that, and you can check it out. But that happens in the same week as uh, DEF CON and Black Hat as well. It'd be amazing if you could share that link. I, I think you mentioned before the skill shortage, uh, and and that to me has an impact on on the the diverse nature as well of, of where we are as a, as a as an organisation in an umbrella term for cybersecurity. But for me, it starts with education. Uh, I think we really need to do a better job as an industry of getting to the schools and and uh, and letting people know from all walks of life that that cybersecurity is. A path that you are accepted, uh, and we can we can we can all share that through our fourteen spheres of influence. That's definitely true. Yeah, I think, I mean, education, and also I think cybersecurity education has been one of those things. Um, it doesn't need to come through just universities as well. Like there's lots of other trainings. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who la- learn about cybersecurity really young, even before university. So it's about just thinking about how else can people learn about these different things. So there's a lot of knowledge out there, but it's about that guidance. And as you said, you know, getting to schools, getting to people earlier on, just to let them know this is there. It's a great career. Um, I think I was um, listening to something and someone said, it's quite interesting that cybersecurity actually has a skill shortage, because if you think about it as a career, it's actually pretty cool. You know, you get to do solve some really interesting problems. I think as a um, as an industry, we actually do deal with things that are quite exciting. Um, you know, things people do get paid decently well. You get to travel, you get to communicate with. So as a career, it's really good. But it's interesting that we're obviously not attracting enough people. And what's the reason behind that? Um, so it's an interesting question. I don't, I don't have the answer for that. But it's, it's something that you do think that if you look at it on paper, it seems like a great career to have. But why is it not attracting that many people? Why do we have a skill shortage? Do you think we've stigmatized cybersecurity and and fear mongered it to the point of it's too technical or it's scary? To, to yeah. me, that that's that's why, right? But I yeah, to change that. That's that's very right when you say that because yeah, now when you mentioned it, I'm like yes, actually that was one of the things that I thought about it coming into it as well. Um, that you oh, I probably need to know how to you know hack something or but I think people forget the fact that cybersecurity is so broad. And a lot of things, um, especially cloud security, actually does not have that high a bar because it hasn't existed for that long. So there wouldn't be someone who has 50 years of experience in cloud security out there. It's only been there for 15 years. So I think things are changing. Obviously, there's various different things that you can do in cybersecurity. So you're quite right. Definitely, um, you know, people may think that it's far more technical. They don't need to. And not every role needs to be that technical. Hey, Shilpi, we were saying before the episode that big mission for yourself is, of course, through the podcast, making cybersecurity knowledge accessible. But then you also mentioned that your intent is to make cybersecurity content really fun. Yeah. How do you plan to do that? Tell us a bit about that. So um, I think for us, obviously, you know, we as much as we're creator of contents, we really enjoy good content as well. And I think one thing that we always do is whenever, and it doesn't have to be cybersecurity, anything that we kind of watch and go, oh, that was really cool. Um, we we are into like travel and food. And I think prior to doing Cloud Security Meetup, we used to do a food and travel blogging, no surprises, as she used to do men's fashion uh, <laughs> influencing. So <laughs> you might find some interesting videos and uh, pictures of him floating around. But for us, it was all my, all about like, <laughs> all about creating. Uh, wait, 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 wait. We can't just, we can't just gloss, we cannot gloss past that. When you go get a little search up yeah. right now. Yeah, it's there is a fine, fine. <laughs> you probably will find all his like cybersecurity stuff, but uh, you know, we have to try and find. <laughs> you yeah, yes. And Ben can employ a few of those Aussie techniques that he learned in Special Forces Cyber. Yeah, uh, so I can find, find, the, find the deeper I've, level of issues. I've got yeah. them here. It's the, his Instagram handle is the peacock in the room. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I thought um, you two should really connect, Ben. <laughs> yeah, on, on beard and fashion. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Nonetheless, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's what I think we were thinking about was like, how do we make it like entertaining? So we we've obviously produced content in other spaces, and maybe that's what kind of comes through is obviously when you do things like travel, fashion, you have to be really entertaining. Like it's it is all fun, you know. There's um, it's not really sort of, you know, an education piece that you're trying to depart there. So I feel unintentionally that's kind of just come through what we do in this space as well. That we want to make it fun. Ashish kind of did a RSA fashion thing as well. So he was actually going and taking pictures with anyone, uh, you know, who was fashionable. And that became like a really fun thing. But again, it's also about, I think it's also leans into that very diverse um, diversity thing that we were talking about that, you know, when we welcome people from, you know, different, different, the way they look, the, the way want, they want to dress, like that's another factor of diversity that, you know, we can encourage. So um, someone in cybersecurity does not have to always be in a black hoodie, you know, that cybersecurity professionals look like all different kinds. Um, so I think that's something we're trying to encourage, but also make it accessible. So yeah, if it's something that's fun, you know, if you want to watch something and it's something that you find quite entertaining, you're more likely to watch it and you're more likely to sort of absorb the information from there. So we're always trying to put that lens um, and we always look at content that we kind of connect with as well. So if I watch something or if Ashish watches something and we go, oh, that was really entertaining. We try to sort of do a little bit of a thinking, going, okay, what was it about that that was entertaining? What really clicked? Um, and maybe bring some of that to cybersecurity. Um, I think that's quite important because some of the topics can be a little bit dry. So you, you want to make them as exciting as possible. It's so great. And we've even had a personal experience, Ben, when like we're posting on LinkedIn and like the, the thing that got the most engagement was like a gif that Ben created of me out of like Seinfeld talking and it just like exploded. So I was like, we need yeah. to do more of that. You're to make it fun, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're still human beings in cybersecurity and we, we like to have a laugh and a giggle. So why not? And if we can make it fun, that, that's even better. People have forgotten that. And I, th I really think that's the opportunity that we have, uh, again, as podcasts and content creators is... <laughs> People are so on edge because of that fine line. I'm going back to it again because we were consistently dab dabbing along that. that uh, I say dabbing like this. We're dabbing mm -hmm. on that line as we're walking across. But it's uh, it, it's okay to have a laugh. It's okay. We've been such a fear mongering industry for so long. People are just really excited to be able to enjoy content and enjoy content that's fun. That's a little bit more upbeat. Yeah, definitely. It, it makes a huge difference. I was just, when he did the dab, I'm like, okay, that can be like a GIF or something. hundred <laughs> percent. Put it, a dab in the middle of a podcast. <laughs> but no, that's very true. And it, it's, it, I think it makes it quite welcoming for especially new people coming into the industry. You know, if they see something that's, you know, easy to absorb, you know, um, they have a giggle in between or, you know, they relate to something. And also humanizing it, I think a feedback that we often get is, um, like when Ashish hosts the podcast, people really enjoy it because, you know, he kind of like if he's um, curious about something or if there's a some experience that he's had, he'll share that very genuinely. And I think people want to hear more of that. So the more honest and open we can be and show that we are vulnerable and we don't know everything, you know, that that's another, um, I think, barrier that sometimes cybersecurity people are afraid that, oh, I, I don't know enough. And it's OK for us, I guess, as leaders or even as, you know, people who are thought leaders within the industry to actually demonstrate that yeah we don't know everything we're still figuring things out exactly how you are as well i couldn't agree with that anymore i think you know what i'm going to listen back to this episode and watch it and count how many times i've nodded she'll be because i've been <laughs> going like this agreeing with all of your statements so it's just been really cool but yeah, we get that feedback too and i think it's the honesty and it's the transparency and it's it's actually getting raw we've done a few episodes where it's just gabe and i talking about you know, our thoughts on, on, on life and, and, uh, and mega trends and technology in general. And one of the ones we did was, uh, as I got back from RSA, um, San Francisco really shocked me, uh, with the state of homelessness, uh, and this, so the disparity between RSA conference, which is such a money generating machine that took up half the city. And then literally four streets away was some of the worst first world homelessness I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those sort of episodes really resonate with, with the audience. And, uh, and if you're listening, feel free to uh, send us some more feedback because that's the reason we do this. And that's the reason why the Cloud Security Podcast exists as well is for our listeners and for the community that we build. So feedback is, is critical for that. And if there is anything that you would like to see, then uh, feel free to throw it into the, the comments as well. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, and even so, like, I think what we've appreciated is even if the feedback isn't great, right? Like, 
I always love like we sometimes I think we had an episode where the sound quality wasn't great at some point and someone said oh you know at this point it gets really bad and I was like thank you so much because you know like that is what helps us improve I really appreciate when someone does come and say you know actually that wasn't great like yeah that's okay we, I totally appreciate that um, because that's what will you know help you grow so um that I, I just wanted to point that out that you know it doesn't have to be like as much as you know I love the you know you guys are doing an awesome job this is amazing that obviously keeps us going but it's equally you know valuable for people to help us improve and say okay this is something we can you know, do a little bit better I've definitely appreciated that I appreciate that too I get so many gifts about me wearing these old headphones <laughs> mainly because I'm deaf as a result of the military that I need to have sound directly implanted into my head yeah uh, what else do we get Ben's floating head with a black background. That was always a good one. But uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the the constructive feedback as well because as you're right, it's, uh, it's, it's a building block to, to get better. Definitely. So now we're on the podcast. You'll be, I want to take you all the way back. I took a few notes earlier on on how it started and I'm keen to dive into that a little bit further. So let me get this right. You founded Kaizen Tech in 2019. Yeah. Prior to that, you started the Cloud Security Meetup in 2018. So we're talking four years ago now. And then yeah. from there, the podcast started in 2019. And then you've also implemented a Cloud Security News in 2021. Now the podcast with your partnership with Sneak and you've gone full-time. How's the transition been from that? That's a whole lot to manage, right? Gabe and I do this podcast and it's, it's a lot of work, but having so many things in that four year period, I'm just looking out to my left here is, uh, is, is huge. How did you balance that with, with a full-time role? Uh, and then as a result of that life, uh, and all things to do with the, the side hustles. Yeah. I, I sometimes do wonder how did we manage that? Um, it was a lot of like, we did a lot of long hours, you know, we was pretty much working around the clock. Um, I think what kept us going was the fact that we, we knew we were onto something, um, quite like pretty much six months in, you know, we started getting a lot of attention. We started getting a lot of love from the community that really kept us going. And I, I remember even with cloud security news, when we started that at the beginning, I was kind of going, um, oh, this is just too much, you know, I've got so much on. And I remember there was one person, you know, who messaged me on LinkedIn and went, oh, I love what you're doing. You know, this is amazing. You know, this really sort of, you know, um, gets me updated. And I'm like, you know what I held. So every time you get in one of those messages, um, you know, you just kind of hold on to that and go, okay, this is going to get me through my next, you know, whatever, 15 hour day that I'm going to go through. Um, I think it's the love of creating what you're doing. And I think for most people, I think it's quite important to do something that you love because I think that's where you'll be able to put in the hours. Um, but I think that's the thing. We truly believed in cloud security. We know that it's a growing field. We definitely believe there is a lot of gap in the knowledge. Um, but also, you know, it was really good to see like guests come on board. You know, we had sponsors. So people were believing in us and putting their time into us. So that that were many little things that happened that kind of told us, yeah, keep going. But yeah, yeah. Um, it was just one of those things. Yeah, it just kept going. You know, every time we felt we didn't have enough steam, something positive would happen and that would just give us the next next little leap. But it, it is just about that consistency and doing something that you really love. I think those are two really key important things that you've got to do. It's when you know you're on the right path as well, when it's just like the universe is telling you something, just keep going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it's been good. I mean, we we do love what we do. So I think that has been the big part of it. Um, for me, it was also about learning. So I think something personally that I've always enjoyed is just learning something new. And I think that was really exciting for me. So um, just learning about a new industry. And I didn't realize there was so much to cybersecurity. And the more I got into it, it was just kind of like a bit like a quicksand. The more I got into it, the more I kept getting dragged in. So um, I love it now. I, I think the conversations are so interesting. There's so many great thought leaders out there and a lot of people are doing a lot of really good work so I think that is all that you know sort of keeps us going but yeah I know it's I think when you spelled it all out I'm like yeah it's actually been a lot but when you're in it you don't see it because you're just like get one foot in front of the other um but yeah we we did you know we made some mistakes but we you know we had some great wild ideas and that took off um it's a lot of sort of taking that punt as well you know you kind of go with this is what I want to do and just strive forward with it and sometimes it lands and sometimes it doesn't but you just have to keep going I guess so three years with the podcast talk us through some of the the most you know valuable conversations you've walked away and it's gone that was phenomenal uh you know it was some of those big trends that come out of uh, our podcast recording yeah um I think we've been really lucky we've had lots of really good guests um I think a lot of our conversations are um 
a little bit technical. So we try to go into what we say, like level 200. So someone who is a little bit in tech, but wants to know more about cloud security. Um, but we've had some really, really good conversations. I think um, one of the, I've, and I, I'm not, I don't want to name favorites because I feel like I'd take away something really good from all of them. <laughs> um, but um, we've had Kelsey Hightower, who's someone who works in Kubernetes. So he's kind of, um, I think, one of the big spokespersons for Kubernetes. And he has a really good way of like storytelling. And I think one of the beautiful conversations he had is, you know, we kept talking about like, okay, is cloud security going to, you know, what's the future for cloud security? And he said, it's going to be very much like the internet because when internet initially came, you know, not everyone was on it and then everyone adopted it. And now it's kind of like no one really even talks about it because it's a given. And that was a really interesting perspective for me. Um, and I always hold to that in terms of, you know, how cloud security is going to transition. Um, we've had some really great CISOs. Um, we've had, you know, the LinkedIn CISO, Jeff Belknap on, on the podcast. We actually met him in um, uh, San Fran when we went for our RSA as well. And I think he just talks about the fact about that balance for a CISO, you know, do they need to be technical or do they not need to be technical? So that was a really interesting um, split. And we've had that conversation with a few CISOs after that as well. And um, I think the school of thought is that, yeah, there needs to be a technical aspect because you do, do need to sort of understand, you know, what your teams are doing and, um, you know, kind of have a direction for it as well. So that was quite an interesting conversation. That That is very interesting to me because... I'm interested in that. You have to have a balance between both, I think. But for CISOs that 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 I spend time with, it's it's less about getting into the weeds. It's more about having the umbrella understanding of all the concepts yeah. at a technical level to hold conversation and then relate it to a business conversation and a risk conversation. Um, and and I think the real the real standout CISOs of the world have done that very well. Uh, and I took a lot out of a few conversations recently where I. I've even uh, pivoted my own masters in cybersecurity to an MBA because, you know, I want to have more of that business level conversation uh, outside of the, the technical conversation, but hold that technical uh, forte as well. Definitely, and as cybersecurity is a business problem, I think that's overarchingly we're often trying to solve security issues within a business. So having that hat is important. But you're quite right. Um, it's not so much about being in the weeds, but understanding the overall concept when, say, one of your engineers or analysts or architects does come and say something to you, you do understand what the true implications are. And they're often the ones who are communicating with the board to make them understand the problem as well. So they kind of need to almost be able to absorb what their teams are saying and kind of translate that to just a business risk level. And interesting job, but I think sometimes it can be a really difficult job as well, where, um, you know, board may have some really hard questions for you. Especially, you know, when you're dealing with things like Log4j, uh, I think a lot of boards are asking, what are we doing about this? Do we need to be worried? And unless you have that finger on the pulse almost, it could be a difficult question to answer. Are you seeing anything come out of like the CISO circles and the communities? Should be just from the conversation you, you've had in terms of those board level conversations or some of that peer exchange type of thought leadership? Yeah. So I think obviously, um, you know, the whole Russia, Ukraine thing, has made people question, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean, you know, anything's worse is going to happen down the future? So that's definitely on people's radars. Um, not so much in terms of, you know, they're actually thinking real applications right now, but it's just something that's made everyone aware that things like this can happen because a lot of um, organizations were quite severely impacted. You know, if you had a team in Ukraine or if you were doing any work in the Ukraine, there were lots of different attacks and different things that had happened. So that was definitely something that um, people were talking about. There was a talk around that. So the um, Black Hat has a CISO summit specifically where, you know, CISOs obviously from across the world attend. So that was one of the talks that happened there. Um, a lot of people are talking about cyber insur insurance as well. So that's become a thing. Um, you know, how can we make sure we're protecting, you know, any data loss and the financial implications of that? What's the right approach? So that's definitely something um, that people are talking about as well. And that there was another talk around that. Um, but again, it's one of those um, things that supply chain is another one that people are talking about, different vendors that they can have on board. Um, so there's various different conversations. Again, with CISOs, I think the thing is they just have to have their finger on so many things, right? They need to think about micro things, but macro things as well. Um, what's happening right now in my team and my organization, but also what do I need to future plan for as well? So they often will have a lot of things on their mind. 
And at the moment, I think the biggest thing is the economic circumstances that every every company is in. So um, there is a little bit of an obviously economic downturn, and you know all, all companies are kind of thinking about that as well. And what does that mean for the security teams and planning ahead? Um, can we be onboarding new products if we need them? So there's a bit of that conversation obviously happening around that. I think more so at Black Hat DefCon rather than RSA. So there has definitely been a little bit of change in sentiment there. What a time to be alive, hey? It's all happening. <laughs> it's all happening. When it rains, it pours. Yeah. I think everyone just needs to take a break and everyone just needs to take a break and just have a dab every now and then. Just I'm just <laughs> I'm just gonna dab all afternoon now. That's my that's my <laughs> thing for the day. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I um you know, the CISOs that, that I've talked to and spent a bit of time with some uh, overseas as well. And it was the general consensus that, you know, when you're surrounded by a group of them in a small setting, you know, it was, it was just down and dirty talking about how stressful is it at the moment, you know, and, and you just see a weight lifted off their shoulders when, when you can talk as a collective and understand that it's, it's stressful, yeah. but at the same time, it's rewarding because they understand that they're making an impact in, in their organization. They're making an impact in the wider vertical of organizations and yeah. it's uh for me it was really cool to see just the the collective of CISOs in that room <clears throat> forgive me on that uh on that night overseas was uh just how how they come together you know the mental resilience of of a CISO or a CSO um is 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 tough but as a community they come together to to hold each other up in uh, yeah. in what can be stressful times yeah. And something that's really valuable at that point is also the knowledge sharing. So I think, as you said, they get a lot of value from talking to each other. Um, that's really, really important as well. But also, I think some. I think there was one of the meetings that happened that, you know, we were speaking to one of the CISOs and he said, it almost feels like group therapy a bit. Like, it's like, oh, I'm really stressed. Oh, I'm really stressed as well. Oh, great. You know, I'm not alone. Like, there's lots of things that are happening. It's It is a tough job. And as you said, right now, it's just an interesting time with so much happening in, in the global setup from the, the Ukraine war. Um, obviously the recession side of things, but a lot of things like the supply chain side of things, but there's a lot of micro things that are happening as well. So there's a lot to deal with at the moment as a CISO. Shilpi, have you got any questions for Ben and I? Oh dear. Oh, questions. So many. It'll be like the next <laughs> one hour. Um, <laughs> I think my question would be what, um, you know, what got you guys interested in starting a podcast? And I, I don't know if you guys have been asked this quite a few times, so sorry if I'm being boring, but I think that's always like something interesting for us because, um, you know, it is a big uh, undertaking. So what got you both encouraged? And I'll, I'll have a follow-up question after that. Yeah, I love it. Two things for me was Ben and I just always got straight into deep and meaningful conversations about the future and where the world's going and technology and cyber. And we always just really resonated with big ideas and solving complex problems as well. And then the second thing for me was I'm also really creative and I love the editing and producing and creating assets. I do trust I have more time in the future to be able to do more at some point. And importantly, like every single episode, we learn so much and it's just really awesome. Like I, I'm a big interpersonal learner and I love hearing other people's perspectives and we just get so much out of diverse opinions and diversity of thought from the guests that we have on for, for me it's uh it, it's it's exactly that you hit the two nails and the third one is this is just how gabe and i talk like as, as gabe said and we thought why don't we just record it and get other guests in where we can learn and and have you know conversations that we can take beyond just our phone calls and text messages and we can create a community that might benefit from some of the conversations that we have yeah. and the, the uh the knowledge sharing from uh from guests like yourself who are thought leaders in the industry yeah, I don't think it's so much like, of course, it sounds like we like the sound of our, our own voice, but if, yeah. <laughs> I think you kind of have to as podcasters, though, like secretly, like if you don't like the sound of your own poor voice or uh, I guess for videos, you know, kind of have to be all right with looking at yourself. So yeah, not a bad absolutely. Thing. No, for sure. Yeah. To that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, like a really big thing that I'm drawn to is sharing knowledge. And if anything, a podcast has taught me how to communicate at scale and it's going to continue to to do that. I'll keep refining that skill. So. It's early days too. And I'm, I think every single podcast episode and every second day, I'm like, Ben, we've got to be better. <laughs> like, we've got to level this up. We've got an amazing opportunity to see, do something really special with dark mode. And for me, like I'm not satisfied with even the growth we've had now or the quality of production that we're doing at the moment. Like I want this to be 10 times as good as what it is because communicating the message around cybersecurity and technology is the heart of it 
for me personally, and to be able to communicate that to as many people as possible and build the community, really similar to how you and Ashish have done with the Cloud Security Podcast, is really the the mission that we have with being anchored in those community focused values. Definitely. I think one thing I would probably say is it's always like it's a constant learning and it's constant evolution. And you want to like every day, you know, you'll be a, want to be a little bit better. We were exactly the same, but also be kind to yourself because it is one of those things that, you know, you it is it is a tough journey. And I think every podcast or YouTuber out there will relate to this. So you have to find that balance, out, as you know, um, you were saying the fine line, there's that fine line for us as well. While we want to keep growing and, you know, you want to be kind to yourself throughout the process. It's great for us. There was a follow-up question. Yeah, yeah, there is a follow-up question. What has been uh, one thing that has been really surprising? Like something when you guys started and you weren't, you know, and this something happened and you kind of went, oh, that, that that was not something I was expecting out of running a podcast. That's a great question. <laughs> I I would have to, well, that is a really good question. For me, it would be uh, the, the response from the community. I, I didn't expect the response in, you know, I expected there to be some response, but a good, good example, I was in Perth two weeks ago uh, and I was at a bar just having a drink with with uh, my friend, my colleague, and there was a girl standing at the bar who kept sort of looking to the left and right. And I thought, oh dear, I'm married. This is me. And then she said to me, uh, excuse me, are you are you Ben? And I said, yes, this is bizarre. She said, do you have a podcast? I said, yes. And she goes, oh, I listened to the podcast, Dark Mode. And we got talking about it. Random person in a bar in Perth. And for me, that just just uh that, that epitomized what we're trying to achieve here and i thought and to me that was a huge takeaway with the uplift in uh the community that, that we're growing so to me that was that was a huge moment and i didn't expect uh that um in, in such a a bizarre setting uh that, that people outside of our close community are listening to the podcast and we're getting more global guests and more more broad guests as well Definitely. That's a beautiful story. I think that's meeting your listeners in real life is, I think, one of the most humbling experiences. And, you know, when they start sharing, like, why they listen to you or what they've gotten out of it, um, I think that's definitely a beautiful thing. What about you, Gabe? Oh, yeah, there's, I definitely resonate with what Ben just said. And even examples where we had Body Crystal on, who is like an expert negotiator with ransomware and cyber criminals. And he it was just like, he had so much gratitude for us sharing knowledge and having launched dark mode. But the thing that is surprising to me, and it's almost inadvertently like, aha, it's like a bit of a gotcha, is like, I, I can just reach out to anyone in the world and say, hey, do you want to jump on a podcast? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, sure. I'll give you an hour and a half of my time. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, how far can I take this? So yeah. I'm absolutely going to run with that and keep running with that and see who we get definitely. on. <laughs> it's an awesome way to have like some great conversations with some awesome people. So yeah, definitely. I think that's, um, that's a good one, actually. Yeah, yeah, totally. Have you experienced something similar, Shilpi? Yes, I think for us, yeah, I think that's definitely, I mean, and I, I, we were kind of probably living in a bit of a bubble being in the lockdown because um, I think our a lot of our growth happened during the pandemic. So we never went to any conferences. So the first one we actually went to was um, RSA. And I think humbly, we, we did not realize how popular the podcast was because the, from the moment we pretty much got into San Francisco, we were being stopped every five, 10 minutes by someone saying, are you guys, and Ashish is like re so recognizable as well. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, you're Ashish. And, and it was just, it was the most, um, yeah, I think it's been definitely one of the most humbling experience. Um, when people just come, they say they love the podcast, you know, the, what they've gotten from it. That's, I think it just, it makes everything worth it. And I'm, I'm so grateful for everyone who does listen and share that, comes up and says that. I think that takes, sometimes it takes a lot for someone to actually come up and, uh, approach you and say that and so we're grateful for everyone who actually makes that effort they don't have to they can just be listening and you know not acknowledge that but the fact that they um, want to come and say hello and share that with us is really powerful um, I think one of the things that is quite close to me and Ashish is um, we got approached by someone remotely wanted to really talk to us and um, I was kind of curious as to why this person was so eager to talk to us and this was someone um, who, and for context, like is a farmer back in India, which isn't probably like a farmer in Australia. It's, um, you know, they probably don't come from the same kind of means. And he would listen to the podcast while he was farming somewhere in a rural area in India. And he just wanted to talk to us and tell us that he actually got a job in cybersecurity about after listening to the conversations. Uh, it's one story, but 
that was just something that we were like, you, you can't even imagine touching someone that remote. In my head, I'm thinking like someone this, you know, listening to this podcast out in the field in India, but has been able to change the direction of their life. And we probably had a really tiny part to play there. So that was really humbling as well. So those are the kind of things. And I think you guys will obviously have many of those stories, but it's worthwhile holding on to that because like, I think amongst all of that, it's about the lives you can touch in a little way. Um, everyone kind of makes their own path, but you know, if you can influence that in a, part, a small way, it's really rewarding. I think for me, that's kind of like the meaning of life. Um, you know, if you can walk away and I'm getting very philosophical here, so <laughs> it's, it's uh, but, yeah, I think if you can, uh, you know, leave the world a better place, it's always good. Yeah. Well, well, that is great. a fantastic story. Yeah. It's just like so heartfelt. Like love to hear that. This is amazing. And you must have felt so overwhelmingly like, wow, it made such a big impact on someone's life. Yes, definitely. I think for us as well, I think obviously, you know, we all want to have good careers and we work towards that. Um, but I think for me and Ashish, I think one of the big things is for us is like, how can we influence you know, people's lives in a positive way. What can we do for the community? That's why that's been really important for us as well. Um, and so things like that, um, you know, really sort of, you know, hone in. And we didn't even know that was possible, you know, doing an Australia, a podcast from Australia that we could, you know, touch someone's life that far away. Um, but since then, obviously, you know, when we are at different conferences, we do have a lot of these different kind of stories. That was probably one of the first ones we heard. Um, and that's really been rewarding. So I think, um, you know, that's what will keep us going, I guess. And hopefully we can continue to do that. Um, that's the aim. Yeah. So great. It. There's also surprising the amount of people that um, are also either starting or have recently started a podcast. Like I've seemed to cross paths with a fair few people in that almost category to say, hey, we should probably like do a meetup and just talk about podcasting, like get together yeah. sometime. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's so many like... And I think we, whenever, you know, someone talks to us, we always encourage that because everyone has something valuable to share. And I don't think they, there's, although it's, it seems like there's lots of podcasts coming out, I don't still feel there's enough knowledge out there. And, you know, you kind of, kind of connect with different people. Like someone may listen to us, um, but might not find like that's where they're connecting, but they might listen to you guys and go, actually, you know what? I really like what Gabe and Ben are saying. So there's enough room for everyone. And I think there needs to be more podcasters in cybersecurity. So definitely, um, and more Australian grown ones. I would love to see that as well. Uh, so I'm really, really happy that, you know, we've got fellow Australians doing this as well. So great. Yeah. Spin that up on the Dark Mode podcast website, Ben. Yeah, yeah we should, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last thing for me that was surprising is uh, I talk about it a lot and I say this statement a lot. So Gabe's probably heard it a bazillion times, but time is the only quantifiable measure of life and and the fact that people decide to spend their hour or beyond with us on a podcast. Um, and I say us as, as podcasters, plural is, uh, is phenomenal to me that, that, uh, that they choose their, their precious time to spend listening to, to my baritone voice and Gabe's, uh, just phenomenal knowledge in her head is, is, is fascinating to me as well. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, like, you know, if time is probably the most valuable thing people have, so they're willing to give you that. Uh, yeah, that's definitely very rewarding. Hey, Shilpi, to wrap up the dark mode episode, I've got a question for you. Yeah. I'm going to ask this to every guest. We started off with an initial question, but we were just nose diving, so we've, we've pivoted <laughs> recently. So I'm going to ask you the, the final question to come to an end, but if you had the whole world's attention for 30 minutes, what would you say to them? Gosh, that's like so many things. <laughs> um, well, maybe we can get think, 45 minutes in. <laughs> yeah, um, I think for me, the main, main thing was a uh, main thing I would like to say, and I think this is well, not so much just for the podcast, but just as a person is um, try to live life on your own terms. Um, you know, do what makes you truly happy, because at the end of the day, you know, you want to reflect back on your life and go, you know what I did, what I wanted to do, and I can't judge on my own terms. Um, I think that's what I would like to see everyone do. So pursue your passions, you know, um, you know, be bullish about it and be unapologetic about it. And, um, you know, that's, that's what you should be doing with your life. So that's what I would love to do. Um, and learn, learn new things, you know, don't be afraid to like, you know, change careers or, you know, take a different path. Um, there's no right or wrong in life. You know, it's about what makes you happy. So I think as, as at a core, that's what something I would love to share. Um, for people in cybersecurity, um, I would just love to say, you know, keep doing the amazing work that you're doing. It is a long grind some days, but I think as a community, I think we can do some really amazing things. Um, I'll 
think back to what was said at Black Hat, I think the keynote person, Chris Krebs, said this, and I think it kind of really stuck with me. Um, he said the cybersecurity, cybersecurity com community has a lot of influence. We just need to own it and do something with it. So um, I would love to share that as well. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Love it. Thanks so much, Shubhi. Great insights. So, thank yeah. you so much for having me. This was actually a really fun conversation. I think the hour just flew by. Um, yeah. It was lovely to get to see, like talk to both of you, but hopefully we'll see you both in the flesh soon as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely make a note of that. So thanks thanks again, Shilpi, for joining us on Dark Mode and look forward to the next time. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Shilpi. Thank you.